1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now tonight is our third study in our current series on spiritual gifts and the local church. And tonight we want to study the scriptures together as we ask and answer the important question, does God promise you health and wealth? Examining the prosperity gospel under the searchlight of the scriptures. Again, let me invite you to open your Bibles, if you haven't already, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Does God promise you health and wealth in this life? If you activate your faith, can you make significant financial gains in your life? Does God have a healing waiting for your cancer? If you would just claim it in Jesus' name. Now, before you brush this off as either bogus or believable, Keep in mind that there are many today who believe that God has promised them health and wealth in this life. Like the 43,000 who attend the Lakewood Church in Houston, pastored by prosperity gospel preacher Joel Osteen. Or the 40 million who are watching or listening to Osteen in their homes in over 100 nations. Or the millions of people all around the world who get fed a steady diet of prosperity preaching through Trinity Broadcasting Network, TBN, founded by Paul Crouch. I believe it's safe to say that you probably know someone in your family or at your job or wherever who embraces the prosperity gospel of health and wealth. In fact, I read today that Charismatics now number one half a billion worldwide. Silver tongued preachers and televangelists boldly promise unending health and wealth to all who have enough faith. And more important, to all who send in their money. One program after program, people are urged to plant a seed with a promise. God will miraculously make them wealthy or healthy in return. But is this what the Bible teaches? Does the health and wealth gospel have the divine approval of thus saith the Lord? Is the prosperity gospel the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and the grace of God? Now we saw last time that all spiritual experience must be measured must be weighed, must be examined in light of the scriptures, in light of the Bible, in light of the very written word of God. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 and 20, we read, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, which were going on in that first century when this was written, but notice, test or examine all things. Number one, hold fast to what is good. And number two, abstain from every form of evil. And so we are called on to be discerning. We are not to be gullible in spiritual things. We are to hear what is said and put it to the acid test or the litmus test of Scripture. We're to be like the brains of old who search the Scriptures daily, whether these things are so. And like the Apostle Paul of old, as a pastor teacher, who am I to be serving God's flock, or how am I to be serving God's flock here at Duluth Bible Church? Colossians 1.28 says, Him, in reference to Jesus Christ, we preach. How? By warning every man, and by teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And there is this element in teaching in which you must warn about false teaching. You must warn about sin. But also you are to teach the positive, your identification in Christ, your blessings in Christ, a life lived by faith and so forth. And the objective is to present every man perfect or mature 
in Christ Jesus. And this is exactly what I plan to do tonight, both warning and teaching, as we ask and answer the question, does God promise you health and wealth? But let's begin with a very brief review of the five principles we considered or covered last Sunday. Principle number one, the possession of certain spiritual gifts is not necessarily an evidence of true spirituality. The possession of certain spiritual gifts is not necessarily an evidence of true spirituality. Keep in mind, we saw last time that the Corinthian church was fully blessed, they were fully gifted, they were fully charismatic in the right sense of the word, but according to 1 Corinthians 3, they were carnal, 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 and behaving like unbelievers. Which tells you that the possession of spiritual gifts is not necessarily an evidence of true spirituality. Principle number two. Being ignorant regarding true spirituality and spiritual gifts can harm you. And that is why we read in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1, now concerning spiritual, pneumaticon, spiritual matters is the idea. Yes, including gifts, but not limited to gifts. Brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Well, that means as they were. But he didn't want that to continue. He wanted to instruct them. Because you see, you're not going to grow apart from the word of God. And you are vulnerable spiritually to be tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, if not worse, if you do not know what God's word says. And you lack the discernment needed. And the only way to have that discernment is to have sound doctrine clearly in your mind. Which led us to principle number three. When the Holy Spirit controls a person, he is not carried away or out of control, for the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. And we noted that in verse two, because while they were ignorant of spiritual matters, they did know this, verse two, you know that you were, in your past, before you were saved, Gentiles, they were pagans, non-Jews, carried away, to these dumb or speechless idols that cannot talk, however you were led. And the word of carried away and the word led speaks of some force, some kind of thing that had controlled them, that was pushing them along, as it were. And they were out of control, which was not uncommon in the ecstatic experiences in pagan Greece in that day as they were involved, as I shared last Sunday, in ecstasy and enthusiasm that involved out-of-control jabbering and, and speaking in what appeared to be tongues and other kinds of things. And he's saying, that's not biblical. That's how you functioned before you were saved. Which led us to a fourth principle. Namely, true spiritual gifts can be counterfeited through human or demonic means. For what they were involved in prior was not rot of the Holy Spirit because they weren't even saved. They did not have the Holy Spirit. And Satan is the master counterfeiter. Thus, the only way to know what is true versus counterfeit is again to measure it against the divine and soul standard of the written word of God. Everything that claims to be spiritual is not from God. In fact, you can pretty much figure that most is not. Which leads us to principle number five. The first test of discernment to be applied to a, quote, spiritually gifted person is that of doctrine, especially regarding the gospel of Jesus Christ, for this has as its source the Holy Spirit. And that's what he's driving at in verse three. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no one can say that Jesus is the Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now what does that mean? Is it not true that you could go up to someone and say, Hey, hey buddy, I'll give you ten bucks here. Can you say Jesus is Lord? He'll take your money and say Jesus is Lord. 
Obviously not because of the Holy Spirit. It's not like, I can't get it out. No, you would just take your money, say it, and walk out. The whole point he's after isn't merely this expression, but the doctrine of it. The fact that you arrived at the right conclusion that Jesus is Lord, he is God, manifested in human flesh. In fact, as we're in 1 Corinthians 12, look over at chapter 15 for a moment. And as we look at chapter 15, what do we see? We see the gospel is presented. I declare to you the gospel. And what is the gospel? Verse 3, how Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. You see, the gospel is about Jesus Christ. It's about the fact that he died as a payment for our sins. It's about the fact that he rose again from the grave. And so when we're talking about the gospel, again, we're talking about the person and work of Jesus Christ. You see, dear friends, the gospel is the good news of salvation. And that is why verse 11 says, therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you what? You believed. You see, that's the one condition for salvation. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, Acts 16, 31. You see, in the true gospel, friends, it is not about health and wealth, but about salvation and eternal life. In the true gospel, it's not about physical poverty, but a payment for sin. In the true gospel, it's not about you, but it's about Jesus Christ. In the true gospel, it's not about getting a Corvette. It's about a cross. And that is why 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You see, dear friends, you can always tell a true gospel from a false gospel. It's very simple. The true gospel will always highlight Jesus Christ, how he died for you, how he paid for your sins, and how he rose again the third day to offer to you Salvation as a gift. Paid for by Christ, offered in love and received through faith. It is not a reward for something you do. And you see, a false gospel always makes it a reward. They're always saying Christ did his part, now you do your part and maybe you can get it. No, it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to God's mercy, he saved us. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that's not of yourself, it is the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. And so, a false gospel may mention Jesus Christ, but inevitably, the flashlight turns here. You must repent from your sins. You must give your life to Christ. You must do something. You must get baptized. You must remain faithful. You must, instead of, no, it is finished, you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. It's the message of the cross. It's the message of an empty cross and an empty tomb. It's a message of a Savior who saves from sin, not poverty. One who saves from the penalty of sin, not being poor. And that's why many poor people over the centuries have placed their faith in Christ and been saved and never got physically rich, though they became spiritually rich in Christ. But let's understand 
the prosperity gospel. What is the gospel of prosperity? It is the teaching that God wants you to claim physical health and financial wealth by exercising, quote, great faith in God. Remember, it's all about physical health and spiritual wealth, and they view faith as a force in which you create your own reality, as it were. And that's why if you just look at their books, look at your best life now. Don't wait for the sweet by and by, as it were. Reach out in faith. Eight steps to create the life you want. Every day of Friday, tell that to the suffering believers in the Middle East or the starving people in Sudan, right? But this is the prosperity gospel. Now, it's also called the health and wealth gospel. It's called the name it and claim it gospel. I saw this one today, the blab it and grab it gospel. That's a different one. <laughs> it's often called the word of faith gospel. And dear friends, those who teach this gospel, I am convinced, are wolves in sheep's clothing. They teach another gospel, which is not the gospel of grace. For in the gospel of grace, you are saved from the penalty power and ultimate presence of sin. In the prosperity gospel, you are delivered from physical sickness and financial poverty, supposedly. And the underlying drumbeat of the false prosperity gospel is, get rich with God. And unfortunately, the only ones who are getting rich through this false teaching are the spiritual predators and scammers who are deceiving the simple and scripturally ungrounded. Once again, I warned you, as I did last Sunday, ignorance is not bliss, it is a serious blunder when it comes to the Word of God. And this ignorance will leave you vulnerable to spiritual charlatans and con men who will scam you. It's like one person quipped about the prosperity gospel. Why wait for heaven to get your mansion? And yet, ironically, these health and wealth gospel preachers are filled with hypocrisy as such teachers like Benny Hinn asked his followers for two and a half million to get out of debt. <laughs> Why don't you just claim it in Jesus' name, Benny? But again, remember, a true gospel isn't about you, it's about Jesus Christ. And yet, Creflo Dollar, what an appropriate name, Wrote eight steps to create the life you want. Is Christianity about the life you want? Or is Christianity about God's will being done? And so we've seen these five principles. We've now seen the position and what it teaches. And let me just make a few brief comments about the preachers. Who teaches the prosperity gospel? Well, let me say a lot of people do. In fact, I just pulled up a picture... You know, here you've got Kenneth Hagin and his wife right here. You've got, I'm sorry, that's not Kenneth Hagin, that's Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Hagin here. You've got, again, Joel Olstein here. You've got Paul Crouch here. You've got Paula White here. You've got Joyce Myers here. And I'll tell you, I was looking at some of the things she teaches today. Wow. You've got Robert Tilton here. You've got Robert Schuler here. You've got, I think it's TJ Jakes right here. You've got Benny Hinn here. You've got the late Oral Roberts here. And on and on we go. In fact, I just pulled up a few of Joel Olstein's books to just show you what is being taught. And again, he's a huge bestseller. I declare 31 promises to speak over your life. Now remember, they think faith is a force in which you create your own reality instead of trusting or resting in the promises of God. You speak these things into action so that God is some kind of servant or utilitarian butler now comes to your aid because you require him to do so. 
here's one, your best life now. You know, when I saw that, I couldn't help but think of Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So much for your best life now. Tell that to the first century martyrs. In fact, Joel Olstein said, and I quote, God wants to increase you financially by promotions, fresh ideas, and creativity. Also, he wants to bless you by good health, a better marriage, better relations, good parking spaces, a college education for your children, and a table at crowded restaurants. I'm thinking he should be running for political office. He goes on to say, God wants to give you your own house. If you're looking for a parking spot, pray, Father, thank you for leading and guiding me. Your favor will cause me to get a good spot. Now, I pray about parking spots sometimes. I do. I'll say, Lord, if it please you. But I don't say, now in Jesus' name, I'm claiming a good spot today. I don't do that. He says, and I quote, expect other people to do good things for you. I've come to expect to be treated differently. I've learned to expect people to want to help me. My attitude is, I'm a child of the Most High God. My Father created the universe. He's crowned me with favor. Therefore, I can expect preferential treatment. Now tell that to your boss tomorrow. <laughs> Here's another one. Good, better, blessed. Living with purpose, power, and passion. Or here, the power of I am. But he's talking about you. Do you remember when Moses was, saw the burning bush? He said, who should I say send me? Tell them that I am sent you. But remember in the prosperity preachers, they think you are little gods. The power of I am, that's blasphemous. Here's another one. You can, you will. Again, you can create your own reality. You know, I see that and I think, well, 2 Corinthians 3, 5 says we're not sufficient of ourselves. To think anything as being from ourselves, our sufficiency is from God. Now remember, how can you tell a true gospel from a false one? True gospel always points you away from you to Christ and what he did when he died for your sins and rose again and salvation as a gift. Now it may mention Christ, but does it mention his payment for sin? Does it mention his resurrection from the grave? Does it mention the grace of God and as a gift? And I say that because Joel Osteen at the conclusion of an Easter sermon gave this gospel invitation with his, which is his standard statement every Sunday. We never like to close our broadcast without giving you the opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Okay? Where'd the flashlight go? Right here, right? The Lord of your life. Would you pray with me? Just say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin. Come into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. Now I want to ask you, did he tell you what Christ did for you? Did he tell you how it was a gift? Did he tell you how it was just through faith? Or did he tell you some things to do? He went on to say, friends, if you prayed that simple prayer, we believe that you got born again. Why? Because you prayed a prayer. Instead of you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Get into a good Bible-based church. Keep God first place. He's going to do amazing things in your life. Yeah, do you remember when Paul got saved? What did the Lord say? You're going to suffer many things for my sake. <laughs> Joel, where are you? You know, when we need you, you know. Here's another one. Every day of Friday. He goes, I know these principles are true because they work for me and my wife. This is the mansion they live in. It's worth $10.5 And that's why I've said before, the real people getting rich by the prosperity gospel are the false teachers who are teaching and not the people who are being suckered by it. Now keep in mind that error always rides on the back of truth. Otherwise, you'll never deceive anyone. There has to be some element of truth 
to what is said in order to deceive. So let's now look at the, well, it was there. Okay. So now let's look at the proof text. How do they try to support this teaching biblically? And turn back with me to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28. Deuteronomy, chapter 28. Now you've got to remember, dear friends, that when Satan tempted the Lord Jesus, he quoted scripture. He just quoted it out of context. And that is why the four C's of Bible interpretation is you always first start by examining the context. You then observe the content. You compare scripture with scripture in order to then conclude. As you've heard before, you can take any verse, twist it out of its context, and arrive at a wrong conclusion. Again, many people practice what I call Beatles hermeneutics. They twist and shout. They twist verses out of context and shout loudly, and people are undiscerning because they don't know their Bibles and they get suckered in. So how do they try to support this teaching biblically? Number one, they misinterpret and misapply Old Testament verses given to Israel under the law and seek to apply them to church-age believers under grace. And seek to apply them, it should be the church here, age believers under grace. Now you should be in chapter 28 of Deuteronomy. Again, historical context, remember, Israel's about to enter the land. This is a passage written to Israel, spoken as it were by Moses. And what do we read? Verse 1, now it shall come to pass if you, now let's pause for a minute, who's you in reference to? The nation of Israel. Diligently obey the voice of the Lord. And that's exactly what the law says. Obey and you will be blessed. Grace says, because of Jesus Christ, you're blessed by grace, and therefore now walk by faith and obey the Lord. Just the opposite. To observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you this day, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. This is a promise of national blessing, not individual blessing. Keep that in mind. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed you shall be in the city, and blessed you shall be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body and pro the produce of your ground, your crops, and the increase of your herds, your livestock, and the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Now, what is true of all of the blessings that have been mentioned so far? They are all what? Physical blessings. Verse 10. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. <laughs> The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses, physical, and in all to which you set your hand, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you, the land of Canaan. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he swore to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Then all the peoples of the earth, again, national promise, shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. Again, physical, 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 national. Verse 11. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods and the fruit of your body, and the increase of your livestock, and the produce of your ground in the land in which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season. In other words, if you obey, God's going to give you good rain, he's going to give you good crops. All physical again. And shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make the head 
Make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not be beneath if you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and are careful to observe them, so that you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I command you this day. To the right or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully his commandments and his statutes which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Usually you don't hear prosperity gospel preachers mentioning that, unless you're in Africa. Verse 16, cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the country, and cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your land and the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Cursed shall be you when you come in, and cursed shall be you when you go out. The Lord will send in you cursing, confusion, and rebuking all that you set your hand to do until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doing in which you have forsaken me. Again, these are all promises to the nation of either blessing or cursing based upon their willingness to obey the law or not. Now, dear friends, this is not written to us. It's written to Israel, not the church. It's about physical blessing. Not that there were no spiritual blessings under the law, because one was justified by faith under the law, which would be a spiritual blessing, but the emphasis is national physical blessing here. And just to show you that it's a promise to nation and not to individuals, go to Leviticus 19. Because there is clear reference made to the poor in the land. Individuals who may be poor, even when the nation is being blessed. Leviticus 19, verse 9. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. This is what happened in the story of Ruth with Boaz. And you shall not clean your vineyard, glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. You see, instead of providing a welfare system for them, the poor had to work, but the rich were to leave the corners of their land in order to give them an opportunity to reap what they were in need of. But notice the mention of the poor. Now contrast what we've just been reading with verses like Ephesians 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us, church-age believers, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Spiritual blessings. Contrast what we've just read with Colossians 2, 8 through 10. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the God bodily, and you are complete in him. You've been blessed with every blessing. You don't need to look for a second blessing. You have them all in Christ. And that is why 2 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4 tells us that God's divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, in keeping with what we've just read in Ephesians and in Colossians. Now go with me to Joshua chapter 1. Here's another verse that they want to take and twist out of context and utilize to promote a health and wealth gospel. Now remember, the historical context is... Joshua is about to bring the children of Israel into the promised land after those 40 years in the wilderness. And God is speaking to him here, Joshua 1, verse 6. And he says, Be strong and of good courage, for to this people... Question, who's this people? Israel, not the church. You shall divide as an inheritance of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them, swore to their fathers. Who's the fathers? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. And they see that word prosper and immediately they think in terms of physical blessing. And they now apply this to today. Now it is true that in the Old Testament, physical blessing and prosperity was promised if they would obey. Verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. And again, they say, see, that's physical blessing. And in that context, it was. Though it could have involved more, but can we just take this promise and just transfer it over to the grace age with all that's saying there? Verse 9, have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage, do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now let me just say this, that all scripture is for us, but not all is written to us directly. These are very clear promises given to the nation of Israel under the law, on the brink of going into the promised land. Now when we study the Old Testament, we recognize there's great value because it's all written for us, though not all written to us. According to Romans 15, verse 4, it's there for our encouragement. According to 1 Corinthians 10, it's there for our example. According to Hebrews chapter 11, there are trans-dispensational principles, principles that are true in every dispensation, like without faith, it's impossible to please him, or like the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. But we must discern and we must rightly divide and we must distinguish when studying the Old Testament certain promises made to Israel that are not found in the New Testament epistles, that are not transferable to the church age, such as the promise of physical blessing for obedience. We must rightly divide the word of truth. Now go with me to Jeremiah chapter 29. Now as you're turning there, let me just say, I like verse 9 here in Joshua 1, 9, but I don't take with it all the Old Testament implications just in the sense that the Lord is with us, we can trust him. That's a principle that applies today. But by way of physical prosperity, we cannot carry that over. Now the same is true with Jeremiah 29, verses 10 and 11. You may like verse 11. I like verse 11. But let's put it into its context and its primary interpretation first before we look at its secondary application. In Jeremiah 29, verses 10 and 11, for thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon. And have you been 70 years at Babylon? No, you aren't. Who's he talking to? Israel. Going into the Babylonian captivity. Ultimately in 586 B.C., beginning in 606 or 605 B.C. I will visit you after those 70 years, God says, and I will perform my good word toward you, and I will cause you to return to this place. What's this place? This place is Israel. Not to your house in Duluth, Minnesota. Verse 11, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And by way of primary interpretation, this is in reference to Israel and a wonderful future they had to look forward to, ultimately in the millennial kingdom to come. By way of secondary application, we can take verse 11 and say the essence of it is found in the New Testament epistles that God does have a plan, according to Romans 12, 2, that is good and acceptable and perfect. We know that there's much hope in the plan of God, and so forth and so forth. But there is no inherent physical health and wealth to be claimed in this verse as was promised to Israel when it was given. Now go to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. Now you're very familiar with this verse. 
But you need to understand how the health and wealth, name it and claim it, prosperity gospel people interpret it. It's Isaiah 53 and verse 5. In this great passage in the Old Testament regarding the substitutionary death of Christ, we read in verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. See that right there? And they'll say, by his stripes we are healed, and therefore we can claim physical healing in the atonement. In the name of Jesus, I claim this healing for so-and-so. And that's how they interpret it. The problem with that is myriad. You see, Isaiah likens in chapter 1 the nation of Israel to be corrupt and full of depravity from the head to the sole of their foot. And he likens it to a loathsome, foul disease. But here he's predicting by his stripes we are healed. And we're going to see in 1 Peter, if we get there tonight, that this is in reference to spiritual healing, not physical. Notice the issue is iniquities. The issues are transgressions, not poverty, not cancer. And that's why, what does verse 6 say? All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquities, not poverties, of us all. So again, a verse taken out of context, misinterpreted, and misapplied. Now go to Malachi chapter 3. And while we go there, keep in mind that the signs and wonders, health and wealth people aren't the only ones who misapply and misinterpret this verse. I've heard a lot of churches do this. A lot of Baptists do this. A lot of other people use this. This is the way, this is the verse they use to squeeze giving out of you. Okay? In Malachi chapter 3, which is talking about Israel, talking about the return of Jesus Christ. And we'll pick it up in verse 4. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem, who? Judah and Jerusalem, not the church age, believer, will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former days. And I will come near you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers and against adulterers and against perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans and against those who turn away an alien because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob, that sound like a church age believer there? No. Jacob, again, is a term for Judah, Jacob, Israel. Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances, and you've not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, God said to Israel here. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? And God says, in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. It sounds just like Deuteronomy 8, 28. Even this whole nation, notice national issues. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Now, keep in mind, the storehouse here is the storehouse of the temple. It's not the vault in your local church. Notice, it's talking about food, because through the tithes, the priests and the Levites were fed and remunerated. Because the tithe was required upon believer and unbeliever alike. It was a form of taxation to support the leadership and priesthood in Israel. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out you such blessing, what ble physical blessing? That there will not be room enough to receive it. 
In other words, your storehouse is just going to overflow. And I have heard many preachers trying to squeeze money out of congregations using this verse, which was to Israel under the law regarding storehouses and misapplying it in our day to the grace-oriented believer. For remember, under grace we read, as the Lord has prospered you, so let him give, not of grudgingly or of necessity, for the Lord loves a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. This again is law. But this is exactly, if you pay your tithes, and by the way, the storehouse in the thinking of the televangelist is his ministry. You send your money in and God's going to open the windows of heaven. I just read a quote today. You send $100 in, you can expect 1000 from God. So they said. By the way, I wonder if they tell the IRS. So they misinterpret and misapply Old Testament verses given to Israel under the law and seek to apply them to church-age believers. This should say number two here, I see. Let's correct that. I was in a hurry this afternoon. Number two, they misuse or misinterpret New Testament verses to support their teaching. Now let's just see that. Go with me to John chapter 10. This is one of their favorite verses. This is the great shepherd discourse. Verse 1, Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up another way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice, yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. And Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. The sheepfold is the idea. All who ever came before me, they're thieves and robbers. They were false messiahs. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved spiritually. And will go in and out and find pasture. Spiritually is the idea. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I'm come that you might have life spiritually and that they may have it more abundantly spiritually. Now I say that because they read that verse and they say, see, God wants you to have an abundant life. He wants you to have the best parking spots. He wants you to have physical blessing. He wants you to be promoted. You just need to have faith. Claim it in Jesus' name. You know, ironically, when you're reading through John and you come to that verse, and then you just kept reading, you would immediately see to arrive at that interpretation is inaccurate. So why is that? Because Jesus would say a little later in John 16, 33, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have bad parking spots. You will have tribulation. Well, why don't you just claim it in Jesus' name, you know? No, be of good cheer, for I've overcome the world. And you would realize, wow, I could never interpret more abundantly physical here in light of that verse, comparing Scripture with Scripture. Now, go to John 14. Here's another verse they like to use. In the upper room discourse of our Lord on the night in which he is betrayed, he is communicating to disciples various truths that will be applicable to them upon his ascension and the coming of the Holy Spirit. And he says in John 14, find verse 14, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And prosperity gospel preachers act as if this is a carte blanche Thing in which you can just, well, you, what do you want? Just ask. He's going to do it for you. 
See, the problem with that is myriad again. Because we're to ask in his name, and his name means with his interests in mind, in light of who he is and what he's done. And furthermore, if you compare scripture with scripture, you realize that 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says this. You know, this is the confidence that if we have in him, that if we ask anything, ah, according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. There are some things we can specifically pray about and expect God to answer because he's revealed his will in his word. But even the Lord Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane said, not my will be done, but thy will be done. And we must think the same way. Now go to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. In James chapter 4, in verse 1, we read, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Believers fighting with one another. What an oddity, huh? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war. And here's what the prosperity preachers like to quote. Just the last half of this verse. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. And they like to quote that verse there. Again, you do not have because you do not ask. You just need to ask. What are you waiting for? Ask for that job. Ask for that new car. Ask for that timeshare. Ask for that parking spot. You know what's so incredible about that? If anyone knew that verse and where it was found, they would know that the very next verse says what? You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Even when you do ask, God's not answering because it's all about you. It's all about your pleasures. It's all about what you want. But again, who looks at verses in context? Who reads the verses before and after the verse? Who finds out the scripture text? Now, I have asked you to pray for millions of dollars. Here at Duluth Bible Church. I've prayed for it. I've encouraged you to do the same. But not to build some ornate building to the glory of man. Or not to pad our salaries and staff, where we all could have been making more if we had stayed in our secular jobs. In fact, I'd be retired by now. Some of you might have wished I, I was. <laughs> but, but for the furtherance of the gospel, that's why I've asked you. Not to spend it on our own pleasures, but to invest and what eternally matters, Jesus Christ, the word of God, and people. Now for the sake of time, I'm going to just skip these next two. I'm going to go to the third one, 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Here's one they like to quote. You're probably familiar with it. It's in the context of grace giving. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. And how do you think they interpret rich there? Physically, right? Now go to 2 Corinthians 6. I want to show you this. If one was reading their Bible, and they were reading through 2 Corinthians, before they ever got to chapter 8, they would read this in chapter 6. Verse 3, we give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. By the way, do you know that the world has blamed Christianity in light of their perception from the tele-evangelists and the prosperity preachers soaking people out of their money? Paul says, we give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. Verse 4. But in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God. In much patience. In tribulations. Really? You have tribulations, Paul? In needs. You have needs, Paul? Why don't you just claim them in Jesus' name? 
in distresses, in stripes, and imprisonments, in tumults, and labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings, by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers, that's how people viewed them, and yet true, as unknown to the world, and yet well known to God. As dying, and behold, we live, as chastened, and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Now watch this. As poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. You mean to tell me that you were poor, and you had nothing? Now he's not talking spiritually, because they were blessed with all spiritual blessings, but he's talking physically. Financially, they were poor. They didn't have anything, as it were. And yet they were possessing all things spiritually. Well, you must really have a low faith, Paul. You must really struggle with trusting God to provide. Because remember, if you don't have the physical blessings you wanted, the guilt is always laid on who? You, and you don't have enough faith. Could it be that it wasn't God's will? Could it be that you believed the prosperity gospel's preachers and their false promises, misinterpreted and misapplied, because you wanted to, because you were vulnerable, because you were needy, and you didn't really come to grips with what the word of God was saying? And so these are some of the proof texts that these individuals use to communicate their teaching. As you can see, friends, that if we are willing to study the Word of God, if we're willing to discern the difference between Israel and the church, between law and grace, between the promise of physical blessing for obedience and spiritual promises based upon the obedience of Jesus Christ. If we are able to discern temporary principles in the Old Testament versus permanent principles that are true in the Old and the New, if we're able again to go back to something very, very basic, and what is that? That the gospel is not about us, it's about Jesus Christ. It's not about physical wealth, it's about spiritual blessing. It's not about what can we get out of God on earth, it's about how we can go to heaven. And as a byproduct, seek to live a life that honors him, that fulfills his will. If we can discern these very basic things, we don't even have to nail every point, as it were, when it comes to what's wrong with the prosperity gospel. It just hits us wrong right off the bat. And that's why people who look for counterfeit bills will always tell you that the key is learning the real deal so well, the real bill, the real 100, the real 20, so well that when the counterfeit comes along, you say, that's not the real thing. That's not it. And in the same way, if we know the gospel so well that we realize it's about spiritual blessing, not physical. It's about Jesus Christ, not about us. It's about a payment for sin, not about poverty. That as a result, when the false gospel comes along, we can spot that and say, that's not biblical. That's not right. We need to avoid that. We need to reject that. We need to expose that for what it is. It's a lie. Now, I am not suggesting for a moment that God isn't concerned about our physical needs. I'm not suggesting God isn't concerned about our medical needs. I'm not suggesting for a moment we shouldn't cast our cares upon him, for he cares for us. But is it not true at times we have prayed for certain things, even physically, but God never answered the prayer because it wasn't his will. Do you remember again, as I said, 
here in a recent message regarding those five missionaries to the Aki Indians. They prayed for God's protection in going in, and God didn't answer the way they wanted. Instead, he took them all home. But through that, he reached the Aki Indians for Christ. And so we can see here, as we're weighing these things out in light of a correct understanding of Scripture, they've been weighed in the balance and found wanting. This is not what the Bible teaches. And we'll consider this more on Sunday. If I continue now, you will not get out of here tonight. So let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross who died for our sins and rose again. And we've seen tonight you do not promise health, nor do you promise wealth in this lifetime. In fact, some of the most godly believers have experienced tremendous physical suffering. Yea, even martyrdom. While ironically, the prosperity gospel preachers of today who claim health and wealth keep dying, one apiece. For Father, you have never promised for the church age believer physical blessing. You've granted it to us many times. You've been very gracious to us. And you've given us things as stewards to use for your honor and glory. But we don't name it and claim it. Instead, we are to walk by faith. We are to cast our cares upon you. We are to remember that though our outward man is perishing, that our inward man can be renewed day by day. We recognize that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed, but it's not now. It'll be later when the Lord Jesus returns, not merely for his church, but with his church to the earth to set up that millennial kingdom and the new heavens and new earth ultimately where there'll be no more death, no more crying, no more sorrow. There will be health and wealth, but not in this lifetime. There will be in the future in fulfillment of your promises. And Father, our hearts go out to those who are deceived by this teaching. In some cases, they may be genuine believers who have had their minds corrupted by this false teaching. In other cases, they have never understood the gospel. I pray for their salvation. I even pray for these false teachers, Father, that you would awaken their conscience to the corruption of their doctrine and so often the corruption of their lives and how they d does not line up with the Lord Jesus Christ. It does not line up with the apostles. And Father, we know that we may reject the prosperity gospel, and yet in our own hearts and lives, we may be guilty of covetousness. We may be discontented. We may have the gimmies. For we know we are never satisfied in our flesh. For apart from a right vertical fellowship with you, we're miserable and life is meaningless. But we thank you that as we present ourselves to you as a living sacrifice, and as we allow not the world to conform us to its will, but your word to transform us, we can test and prove and embrace and enjoy your good and acceptable and perfect will for our lives. So thank you, Father, for the word of God. May we not be unwise, but understanding what your will is. And thank you for all the wonderful blessings of your grace. In Jesus' name, and amen.